Uh, good evening, good afternoon. This is Brian Jacob from New York City. Thank you so much for the invitation to give this lecture uh, about social media for surgical education, post or perish. Uh, it's a true honor. I have been very, very passionate about social media and its use for the widespread global dissemination of surgical education uh, with the main intent to optimize patient outcomes uh, since uh, the last decade and to see how much it's grown uh, and to uh, see how well it's been incorporated into many of your lives uh, is, is truly uh, heartfelt. Uh, assignments, none of which uh, will affect the content uh, of this forthcoming lecture. And if I do my job correctly today, uh, you will learn something new, uh, either about the value uh, behind using social media for surgical education, or perhaps uh, getting rid of some of the myths you may have about it. Now, I wanna start with a brief introduction to ask you if you know who Tim Berners-Lee is. And the answer is you may not, uh, but you probably should because Tim was actually the inventor of the World Wide Web. Uh, back in 1990, uh, he was the first to publish a website. And by 91, uh, the World Wide Web was up and running. And what Tim Berners-Lee uh, really did not intend on doing was disrupting many of the things that he actually disrupted, uh, including but not limited to the way we read books and our news and our stocks, uh, as well as the way we get our music or our videos or even the way we date. Uh, these are all things he never intended to disrupt with the World Wide Web, but clearly uh, we have disrupted it. Uh, what was more interesting is that Tim Berners-Lee was actually a scientist, uh, a computer scientist to be exact, from, uh, from England, and he uh, was a researcher. And I think the main uh, intention initially was to disrupt the way that we share medical literature, uh, which is interesting because really it's the last thing uh, that it's been unable to disrupt. Uh, and if you followed this trend over the last 10 years, it's been very obvious how uh, embracing uh, it has been. So these are my four kids, actually, ages uh, 6 through 13 in this photo. Undoctored, but you can see they're all uh, genuinely and heartfelt uh, attached to their devices uh, and using it not just to look things up, but to collaborate with their colleagues and their peers uh, in real time. And if you have any children of your own, you'll know that online gaming is extremely important. Uh, online communication, collaboration with each other, talking about the things that are important for that peer age related conversation uh, is nonstop. And it's happening on our mobile devices and on gaming devices like this. Here's an interesting statistic about a company that you may not have heard of called Roblox. Roblox uh, is an online collaborating uh, tool for younger kids. Uh, if you look at the left side of the screen, the average user age for Roblox is 15. They range from six-year-olds to 18-year-olds. So this is definitely our youth. And what's most impressive is if you look at the current number of online users today, we are at over 150 million users uh, as we are entering 2021. And this company just went public. Uh, so Roblox is growing. Our youth is collaborating online in huge numbers globally, huge. And the thing to remember is that this is the generation that's going to be our future surgeons and doctors. Uh, we are all familiar with the robotic companies that are out there. And what's beautiful about the robotic companies, uh, especially Intuitive, is that they uh, allow for uh, ease of use uh, in their technology. And so they can uh, use uh, advanced technology to take simple tasks like taking a yellow rubber band and placing it on a red peg and then allow our youth to actually learn how to operate. This is actually my daughter uh, when she was seven years old, already very successful. And I can tell you that doing this with straight sticks was nowhere near uh, as uh, intuitive, if with no pun intended. So technology is keeping up with our children. Uh, you may remember that to get to be able to present our surgical education videos, we once had to put it on a VHS tape like this, submit it to a society, wait three months for them to look at them all, and then let us know we were going to be able to present. That's very different than today, when if you have a USB port, either a YouTube channel or a Facebook group or a LinkedIn and a smartphone, you can publish yourself. You can get your word out there, uh, your technique out there and start helping your colleagues and helping your patients. So 
education, what do surgeons like to do? If I can just bring this back to us. Well, we obviously love to operate. Uh, we would not be where we were today without it. But once we're done operating, we genuinely love to teach. And if it's not our immediate partners or our colleagues, it's other people in different lectures, students, residents, fellows, uh, and fellow surgeons. And we do like to share this as wide as we can. And we share our educational abilities as wide as we can through current uh, situations like conferences and hands-on labs, uh, coaching and mentorship programs, and of course, publishing. But each of these has their limitations. Conferences. Conferences are amazing because we get together, we get to socialize. But I can tell you that once we leave, a lot of us just go back home and go back into what we were doing traditionally without staying in touch with what we learned. So conferences have a limitation that we uh, don't stay in touch afterward as often as we could. Uh, plus, if you've been to conferences lately, especially towards the end of them, we are uh, met with empty rooms. And there's nothing more disheartening than to a lecturer than to lecture to four or five people in a room uh, when you were anticipating uh, 100 or 200 people in a room. Hands-on labs are great. We can't learn new techniques without them. Uh, however, uh, that requires people to travel and for those of us uh, who are teaching to stay as a mentor. And some of us don't have mentors, so we don't know where to get these hands-on labs. So accessibility uh, to mentors has been a challenge. Uh, plus, as we travel and we leave our home, uh, our children or our spouses may be upset that we're always on the road. Uh, those of us who have been teaching for a decade or so can know that there's real life uh, family impact when you're on the road uh, many times a year. Finally, publications. Uh, this seems to be the main way that we are always going to keep in touch with each other and document our work. Uh, nothing's going to disrupt this. It's been in place since the early 70s, and the adage uh, publish or perish has been extremely important uh, in that if you don't publish your work uh, in the National Library of Publications, uh, that you probably didn't do it. You can't claim your territory. I challenge that to say that in today's age, uh, we can choose any number of online digital platforms to actually publish our work uh, where it can remain for almost as long and, and give us just as much relevance. Uh, in my line of work, I have embraced Facebook uh, as the uh, platform of choice, mainly because of its widespread, uh, accessible, uh, and obtainable methods of getting it. It's in every country and every smartphone, and it's pretty familiar. At least when we started, everyone was using it. Uh, for keeping in touch with friends and family, and it's migrated into, uh, for at least me, uh, a place where only uh, I use it for work and not for social things. Uh, it turns out that 54% of patients actually are very comfortable with their providers seeking advice from online communities to better treat conditions, and so we're seeing acceptance of our patients, uh, allowing us to use it for places that we get our advice. And then uh, 60 percent of social media users uh, that like me and, and you are more likely to trust posts uh, and activity by doctors over that of any other group and that is true when you see uh, colleagues with names that you recognize post things uh, there tends to be immediate credibility uh, for the most part and that actually in many uh, situations will outweigh the credibility of even a publication uh, so if you see our colleagues doing something that resonates with you, that feels right to you, that you think is good for your patients, even if there's a publication saying the opposite, you're going to tend to migrate towards uh, the advice of your colleagues that you trust online. Very interesting fact. So Facebook groups, which is not the same as a Facebook page, not the same as your regular social media posts, a group is a private area that you can only get into when you're allowed into it. Uh, so it's very private. And uh, I found these in uh, about a decade ago. And in 2012, December 13th, uh, so we're going on nine years now, uh, I set up a group. I called it the International Hernia Collaboration. Uh, and we started and off we went with nine uh, surgeons collaborating about groin pain. Um, and just by clicking the, the word create. I really didn't have any intention of it. Uh, for those of you that have heard of the International Hernia Collaboration, you know that it's grown. Uh, that was never our intention. It just happened because people that were using it found value on the site and kept going back to it. Uh, there was no promotion of the site. We didn't go out and try to sell membership. Uh, it just happened. And why did it happen? Because for the first time, uh, the old way that we used to obtain data through uh, online resources suddenly became that we could get it from each other. 
Uh, and that really had something that resonated with surgeons over time, where this ability to collaborate over a single case or collaborate over a CAT scan, collaborate over a treatment method, or even just hash out uh, what a publication was about. That uh, was brand new. And for the first time, we had this concept of obtaining consensus on the way to treat a disease state as opposed to just one advice of a paper or a person. And so uh, you all know that the way we want to treat a hernia in a 30-year-old skinny female or an elderly obese male or a kidney transplant immunocompromised patient will vary amongst users. And you'll get options A, B, and C. Uh, and the important thing here is to take the consensus of those, those different options and then see what you want to do best for your patient. And the process works very simply. Uh, similar to a publication, you upload your case. It's basically peer reviewed by a bunch of colleagues and then you come to a consensus uh, as a final part of the thread. And the way that looks for those that don't know, for example, here's Dr. Carden uh, asking for advice on how to manage a recurrent incisional hernia. He posts a CT scan. Uh, and of course, you know, traditionally we would go ahead and just figure out how to do this ourselves. But in the modern day world, we can get 51 comments in over the first two days from our colleagues. Uh, and not only that, our colleagues can be from around the globe, not just our state or our hospital. So now all of a sudden you're getting credible, real feedback on your case, uh, not just from a paper that you read, uh, but from people who have seen it, done it, who can help you through the actual operation themselves. And there's nothing more reassuring uh, than bouncing what you thought you were going to do off of some more colleagues. So I just decided to look on the International Hernia Collaboration today just to see what came up. Uh, and this is some real time stuff that's happening actually today. Uh, uh, in May, 2021, you can see that there's a CAT scan with a question of whether or not that's a recurrent inguinal hernia or a seroma. Uh, there's a post an hour ago uh, about chronic pain that would happen after varicoselectomy. Um, here's one from my friend Hugh in Australia that came in a few hours ago. He was looking for a diagnosis on a certain condition uh, that he couldn't figure out after multiple imaging studies. And I was able to chime in, ask a few questions, and help him come to a diagnosis of anterior cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome. Uh, and so here I am in New York helping a patient in Australia uh, on a random Monday. So it's kind of cool to be able to do things like that. Uh, I don't know much else out there that's like that. Uh, as these posts fill up and populate and become part of the past, uh, it's called user-generated content. Uh, user-generated content is stuff that we create ourselves together, and it turns out it's very, very popular. In fact, 35% of user-generated content is more memorable than other media, uh, and 50% uh, more trusted than other media. So we are on the right track uh, with the social media created surgical education content. In modern day uh, world online, we are teaching through video. Now, there's no question that the videos that are being published are amazing and we can learn from it. Uh, we're teaching through collaboration with our industry partners. Uh, again, uh, companies like BD have embraced this technology. Uh, here is a live uh, question and answer session that we did with Dr. Ornstein. Uh, and Bard BD, that was uh, about a month ago. And what's nice for these companies uh, as well as that we can give them insights as to how that video went. So here's a you know 45 minute lecture that we put up and we can see that it reached uh, almost 4,000 surgeons across the globe uh, and the video was viewed almost 2,000 times. Uh, so that's not bad uh, for a small group of, I guess we're approaching about 11,000 people now. And what's even more interesting to me is that now all these groups are searchable. Uh, so you can go on there with your case or your question and actually look up uh, threads from eight, nine years ago, uh, four years ago, and get really good answers and advice and keep the threads going. I mean, all these threads are live, uh, so they're not uh, static. You can actually contrib contribute to them in real time. Uh, our uh, group now is seeing about 220 posts a month uh, over the past uh, life of the group. That's over 16,000 peer reviewed cases. We're global, we're in about 99 countries. Uh, the top three countries remain the United States, India, and Mexico, with Colombia, Brazil, and Australia right behind them. And we keep track of the comments, reactions, and views of these posts. This is the new way to judge reach, and I think it's very important to uh, look at view count uh, moving forward. It really will represent impact uh, as we go ahead. Uh, it's taken a while, but the societies have caught on. Sages uh, actively uses eight different groups that we help them start. The colorectal society uses groups now. The hernia society uses groups now. Pediatrics 
Uh, truthfully, I think we're in everything. We're in oncology now, vascular surgery, uh, you name it, it's out there. Um, and so it's really exciting to see the movement uh, continue. As far as specialties are concerned, uh, we've seen uh, many different bariatric groups grow. Uh, my favorite is Tom Rogola's uh, International Bariatric Club with uh, Harris Kualja now running it. Uh, we've got oral maxillofacial surgery, uh, high tech surgeries, journal clubs, uh, you name it. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them, including the robotic surgical collaboration, uh, which is a tremendous success and an offshoot of the IHC friends from early in 2015. The other thing I like about this for most surgeons is if you're on it, you actually can increase your referral base uh, as you become uh, more credible on the sites, more people actually send you patients as patients look for people in your neighborhood. Uh, we, we've been able to demonstrate the ability to get CME credits through groups and some of the activities that are being used there. So all the time that you spend online is not for naught. Uh, so I believe uh, while we started off as a publish or perish nation, we're now into a post or perish nation. Uh, this is a phrase uh, that has been trademarked by a law firm, but I love using it in this uh, realm because I do think that if you can post your video, post your opinion, uh, you will remain very, very active. There are papers that have studied our group. Uh, this is one done by the uh, Hernia Working Group. Uh, it was led uh, by the primary investigator, uh, Mike Liang, and they found that our social media groups like the IHC can be a useful method to communicate challenging problems and important surgical uh, educational tools. Uh, Sage has also published a white paper uh, promoting the use of closed Facebook groups uh, for this exact use and endorsing our group specifically. And of course, I really believe that the main thing here is that if we connect all of you, all the doctors, then you connect the patients to better outcomes. And by connecting the patients to better outcomes, uh, that's the name of the game here, for sure. Uh, the next step in this is to take the data that is being collected behind the scenes. Uh, the scroll above you is basically just a demonstration of all the data that can be collected from all the posts and all the comments that are made, and then figure out a new way to get information, not just back to the doctors and to the patients, but also to the industry uh, and also to the hospitals about the optimized outcomes. And I think that's really the next step. Uh, it's where Facebook falls short because we can't use the data on the back end to do that, but I think there's definitely potential as we move forward. And uh, taking all that user-generated content that's that's now out there uh, and figure out new things that we can do with it, like disseminating and educating, discussing, mentoring, and publishing specifically. And I do think publishing is the next uh, great frontier for our ability to collaborate. Final conclusions are that the next generation of surgeons will require a version of social media dedicated to collaborative learning and publication. So I think that that's really important. I think the IHC and the entire Facebook group or closed group movement uh, has proven feasibility and that clinical posts can be a publication uh, to those engaged and all that together will enhance patient outcomes. I do think some of these threads eventually need to get published into PubMed to really increase its dissemination, uh, but that's for another talk. So again, thank you very much. I'm Brian Jacob in New York City. I look forward to seeing you online in the IHC or another one of your favorite groups that are out there. Uh, as you know, there's a European group now. Uh, there's uh, several in India, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and around the globe. Thank you very much.